So, are you ready? So, yeah. we'll start in about two minutes. Okay. Suzanne will introduce. Okay. But I did, I was asked, do any of you know how to. So, does it have a, pla a, a plug and play? So there's nothing plugged to the laptop. Mm. Okay. So they have to communicate somehow. And um, unless they communicate through Bluetooth. Potentially. Um, if you can open your Bluetooth, maybe it recognizes the... I've never used a Mac, of course, I don't know. Uh, I don't have a Mac. Do you have a Mac, Maria? Yes. Oh, this is a Mac. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I have to learn a Mac. I've, I've, I tell my print, my uh, secretary, can you buy me a MacBook so I can practice? It's it's like a, a shrine. It doesn't. No one touches it. I was like, I, I can't do it. So let's see if it recognizes devices. Yeah, it says it's on, so we just have to wait for it to come up on. Here. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I can think of. Yeah, me too. Well, it's this not, one is on it's too. Muted, it's muted that way. Yeah. Yeah. Words, 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 words. Can you try turning this one? That's, no, that's oh, on. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah, and they're actually. It's on. You're not going to hear one. anything. It's only going on the camera. I should have explained it to you. That's not a PA system. That's why you're muted. Here it is. This is what you need. Do you have a place where to plug it? Um, no, we can't plug it. <laughs> so it doesn't have a USB. And then uh, I think we're done. Now we know. Is it on? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it okay. has to have a plug and play. <laughs> we got it to work? Uh, no. No. No, because that wonderful Mac does not have any. Doesn't have oh, I'm sorry, a. It's okay. Sorry, uh, any any USB ports. That's weird. It doesn't explain, have a USB. Uh, the microphones are only going to my camera. There's okay. No PA system in there. Okay. Okay. So there's no amplification from those microphones. They just go directly to our camera system. So use your teacher voice still, right? So they can Correct. hear us. You can speak to the crowd. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to be yelling on the mic. <laughs> <laughs> so just much. lower it down over there on yes. your end. Because I use my teacher voice. Okay. Yeah. So, hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm going to be yelling on it. Are we clicking or are we sitting next to it or they don't know yet? They're going to cl click. Ah, you oh. do have a place where to plug. Awesome. Oh, yes. Oh, that's much better. Okay, so I do. On the side? Here it is. How many minutes do um, we have? Because that's my thing. <laughs> okay, so um, I will count on you ladies to raise your hand at five for me, please. And I, I know I can, but I will probably get into I know myself. I just get into what I'm saying, and I will completely forget that I have that in my hand. I'll do my best, though. So you want somebody to tap you or? <laughs> it's just, uh, raise your finger. <laughs> that is so awesome. I need to buy me one of those. <laughs> I was just saying that timing is not my, my thing. <laughs> so Let me get this. I will probably take more time than what, what I should take. I, need, I like to write and I like to. Okay, we're ready now.
going first. Yes. <laughs> so you are, you said you're a consultant um, with different school districts, is that how? School districts, state departments. Okay. Yeah. Of education, not just the state department. Specifically newcomer? Primarily, but also all struggling learners, um, like K through 12 and adults. Okay. And I'm an author, so I do a lot of writing. Cool. These are, my, yeah. these are the three books that focus on newcomers. I have other books. I have to like. Um, wow. I'll take. I'll take pictures of that in a minute because I definitely need to do some uh, some more reading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have my website. There's a lot, not, there are also the articles. Uh, you can either download them so you don't have access to email me, and I can do access. Okay. So okay. Okay. Okay, awesome. Now one day, I'm gonna, one day I'm gonna grow up to be just like you. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel very old. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's 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 um it's all about your accomplishments, right? And so one day I want to be accomplished like you. Oh, I'm sure you are the principal of a newcomer school. I'm sure you have a lot to share. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, we're still learning. We're still learning. We're still All the time. Yeah, All the you, time. You stop learning, you, you, you stop being efficient. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why, you know, I was like, you know, I'll be interested to see your books and kind of read them because that's how I, I mean, I am what I am today because I'm continuously, that's why I'm like, when I was like, you know, take your school, check your school out. And There's nothing like going to schools because every time I go to a school and spend time with the teachers, I learn something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Never, ever Correct. Every situation is different. Every. And uh, there's similarities, but there are also a lot of differences. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's encouraging when you go, you, know, you see the new school, you see programs from the program, but there is this movement. Yeah. That's really awesome. How many are in your school? Uh, currently, we have 280 students. Um, I was telling Marie that last year, during the huge influx that, that we had at the beginning of the year, we got to 530 students. And what happened to the rest of the students? What do you mean, what happened? You said 500, so you down to something? Yes, because we are a one-year school. That means that they transitioned, and now they are all pulling their hair. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Before it was just our problem. Hi, my name is Suzanne Shanahan. I direct the Kinema Institute for Ethics, uh, where the Kinema Refugee Project is home. Uh, the Kingdom Refugee Project is a research advocacy program uh, run on the creativity and energy of students. Mm -hmm. uh, this particular workshop, uh, Rethinking Newcomer Education, uh, was the vision of Olivia Simpson here, together with Sneha Sharma. <laughs> Her partner in crime, Sneha, mm -hmm. is, alas, taking the LSAT. <laughs> uh, for which we should all feel sorry for him. <laughs> but he's not having much fun, and we will have great fun here today. Um, and I think I'll just turn it now over to Olivia to get rolling with our first panel. So Thanks. welcome again. So great to see everyone here. Great to be here. Thank you again for that introduction. Um, I think that pretty much explains the background, so we'll just leap right in. I want to introduce um, my panelists here. To my left is Dr. Andrea DeCasso. She is an education consultant um, and works in the area of um, newcomer education, specifically looking at students with limited or interrupted formal education. Um, and she is the co-developer, is that correct? Of the newly adaptive um, learning protocol, which is gonna come next. Paradigm, I'm sorry. <laughs> so she's gonna talk some more about that. Um, and then to her left, 
is Blaine Golden, and she is the curriculum facilitator at the Newcomer School um, in Greensboro, just a little bit mm -hmm. to our west. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the end is uh, Maria Moreno, who came all the way from Houston um, to talk to us about her school. She's the principal of Los Americas Middle School um, in Houston, Texas. And so she can begin us with Texas. Well, thank you very much. I'm very excited, very pleased to be here, not only to share my knowledge, but also to learn from my panelists this morning and also from all of you. Um, and I'm just going to put a plug in. You can follow me on Twitter, some of you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Twitter. Uh, it's always encouraging because I learn a lot from people who, who tweet as well as putting out educational issues and issues related to uh, this population. And there's a lot. It's just, these are very trying times, so it's wonderful to be here with people who are advocating and for this population and who are very interested in promoting educational mm -hmm. resources. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start by showing you, starting out with, with this slide. And I start with this slide because the idea is, my work centers on the idea that our culturally influenced ways of learning, the learning experience we've had, they develop certain types of cognitive processes. And these cognitive processes influence how we understand and interpret the world around us. And this includes how we learn and how we teach and how we understand what it means to learn and what it means to teach. And our students with limited interrupted, no formal education, are going to look at the world very, very differently than we are. And so we can all look at the same concrete real life object and we're going to look at it and understand it very differently. And this carries over into how we think. And if you consider that informal education develops very specific cognitive processes. You know, we, on one hand, we think of formal education, the first thing that comes in, into our mind is about literacy, of course, and subject area knowledge. But it goes a lot deeper than that because we're looking at the world through what Flynn always call, calls scientific lenses. And it has nothing to do with science necessarily except for the fact that these are cognitive processes in how we look at and interpret the world. So um, thinking about who our population is, these are slice, they're coming from a very, very different world. Students with limited interrupted formal education versus other L's. So the first thing, of course, is the fact that they're coming from different ways of thinking. They don't have the, the same educational background that other elves do. Other elves come to us, they have age-appropriate or age-level <coughs> education. Um, you know, the, they may have had a small interruption, but not a significant interruption. Of course, there's a complete question that there's no or low literacy. The other elves are going to have age-appropriate L1 literacy, regardless of the language, regardless of the writing system, once you have literacy, and you see literacy as a process, you see and understand a representational two-world, two-dimensional world which differs from the concrete world. And they're missing, the slice miss content knowledge. They're missing a lot of content knowledge, much of it's foundational. The other L's are coming and they have content knowledge, of course, different school systems will introduce different parts of subjects in different ways, and if you come from Colombia or China, you're not going to know U.S. history, but you have developed this idea of historical time, you have an understanding of how knowledge and formal education is divided into discrete subject areas, regardless of whether or not we have like interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary studies, you have <coughs> formed certain ways of understanding the world through these scientific lenses all because of the content knowledge that we have developed. And very key, and this all um, um, cascades into slice are unfamiliar with doing school. They don't have an identity as a learner. And this can range from those who come with no education, formal education at all, who don't know how to hold a pen or pencil, uh, those who may know how to copy letters but don't know what to do with them after they've copied them, to those who are farther along in what I call a ways of learning continuum where they had formal schooling to a certain degree. And, but when they come, they don't know how to engage in the decontextualized school-based tasks based on and derived from academic ways of thinking that we take for granted and that we use to build and demonstrate mastery. 
So unlike other elves, they know how to approach material, and they know how to approach material uh, content, and they know what to do with it. What they're missing is language. Where the elves, mm -hmm. the slice are missing, missing much more than language. Mm -hmm. What well, the things in front of me. Uh, so I have five recommendations on <coughs> working with slides, and this is sort of like a foretaste of those who will be coming to my workshop. We're going to be working a lot with these, looking at how they apply to instruction. But the first recommendation is we want to incorporate immediate relevance. Remember, they're coming from the concrete world of, of the real world. And when we talk about immediate relevance, as teachers, this is what we do. We look at immediate relevance. but the issue is we don't want to do it from our perspective because we don't have their perspective. So we have to do it from their perspective, which means it's immediately relevant to their lives, not to the curriculum, not to what we think is going to be relevant. Mm -hmm. And we're often very much surprised mm -hmm. because their priorities are not necessarily our priorities, the school priorities. And this again goes into we want to foster a sense of interconnectedness. You know, we want to build this learning community in our classroom, in our school, and this home family connection. And it's a community where we're not the only ones giving them information. This is what the school expects, this is what you have to do, this is what we want, and so on and so forth. That's one way of communication. But when we're fostering interconnectedness, we're really looking at two ways of communication. We need to go into the community, learn from our students using cultural brokers, cultural informants, if there's language or other questions. What is it that they want? What is it that they expect? What is their world that they're living in? And that also leads us into being able to truly incorporate immediate relevance mm -hmm. into our teaching. And then uh, the, the one I like to always focus, spend a little bit of time on is, even though I have limited time, is we're going to intentionally use the oral to scaffold the written. Um, they come with rich resources. They have very strong oral skills. A lot of them, depending on what their background is, they can recite hours and hours of you know, poems and songs and stories. They can, uh, they can remember grocery lists, but I can't, you know, mm -hmm. unless I've written it down. You know, going from this very discreet, being able to remember to longer excerpts, but we want to, we want to honor and we want to capitalize on the oral. And we need to move beyond thinking of language as the fourth skill areas, you know, reading, writing, listening, speaking. Because what we want to do is we want to incorporate early literacy practices, the kind of practices you use with children who are learning to read. Because they have oral skills, these children, right? And we're capitalizing on them. Of course, we have to remember they're elves, and they are, my work focused on fourth grade and up. So they already have other capacities. We're not going to use young children you know, stories and pictures, it has to be age appropriate. But we want to make sure we're scaffolding the written by capitalizing on the oral that they bring to us. Mm -hmm. And, oops, <coughs> sorry. Um, and then uh, we're going to integrate shared responsibility with individual accountability. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you think about where they're coming from, the world that they're coming from, they're coming from a world of real world learning in the, within the socio-cultural practices of their family and community. And where learning takes place <coughs> in the sense that you, know, you learn from somebody who knows more than you do. It's more of a mentoring approach, you're working together either in the, with one or two or many mentors, you're working in these groups, and it doesn't matter who does what, you just <coughs> work together. Our school system, no matter what we talk about in terms of collaborative learning, is focused on individual learning. You have to have a grade, you have to take a test, and you have to get you know, uh, assignments done where you get graded. And so what we need to do is think about how are we going to capitalize and include group, uh, shared responsibility while at the same time making sure that there's an individual piece that they are accountable for whenever they're working together so that there's a natural back and forth from the individual, the group, so that when they come to the classroom that they feel comfortable asking their classmates and using them for, as resources, but at the same time they know and they're able to do it when they have to do a test or some other independent, they know how to do that. And finally, um, remember I started off talking about the cognitive processes, different modes of thinking. We need to focus on 
developing academic ways of thinking. So this is probably the hardest and the least visible aspect of working with flight. Because we come from a world of formal education. We live in a world, the modern, industrial, first world, whatever you want to use, where these are the norms. We, we hand out norm routinely, forms <coughs> to fill out. Forms are based on academic ways of thinking, and we don't realize this. And a lot of the things that we do, the ideas that we, or the tools and the techniques that we use to scaffold are decontextualized, school-based tasks derived from academic ways of thinking, whether it's fill in the blank, matching, um, using Venn diagrams, we can go on and on. So if we're going to do, teach them and or promote academic ways of thinking, we want to start out with familiar language and content. We're not going to throw in new language, we're not going to throw in new content because we're focusing on the thinking. And in the workshop, you'll see how that's done. Um, but we want to make sure that we think of things, you know, li the literacy, the content, and the ways of thinking as three separate schema and how we're going to introduce one at a time. And these five recommendations really fall are the basis of the Mutually Adaptive Learning Paradigm, which Olivia mentioned. <coughs> uh, this is a, an instructional model, and it <coughs> takes, the, and what it does is asks us to mutually adapt. It means the students have to adapt, and we have to adapt. Rather than saying we're going to do it all our way, we've seen, unfortunately, that this does not work well. And we also know we can't do it all their way because we want them to succeed, not only in our schools, but in our <coughs> world. Um, so we're going to mutually adapt. First of all, we're going to accept the conditions that they need for learning to take place. Remember recommendations one and two? We're going to accept those and to make sure that they are in part of our instruction, part of our classroom, part of our school. Combine processes, processes for learning. How do we access and transmit information, to access and transmit knowledge, we're going to combine the processes. We're going to make sure that we do both in our classrooms and in our schools. And these are recommendations three and four. And the fifth one, which I've teased out, is the idea we're going to do a lot of work with decontextualized tasks that are based in academic ways of thinking because we're training them to think in ways that we don't realize that are unfamiliar to them necessarily. Again, using familiar language and content. And that, and those of you who are coming to the workshop, what we'll do is we're going to look at lessons and how you improve MAP. Because the idea of MAP is you don't throw out everything you know, and you're going to you use MAP to help evaluate what works, what doesn't work, and why. And it is a framework to help you do this. It is also a way of evaluating your cultural lens of understanding and interpreting the world from the perspective of formal education and helping you see their world. So that basically <coughs> concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> So some of the things that I'm going to be talking about are posted on a Padlet. If you want to, if you have a device and you want to access it, the, <coughs> the passcode is today's date. So everything that I will be talking about and everything that I will be sharing during our small group's time together um, is posted there. And the teacher in me wants to break protocol. Can I stand up? Is, is that, is that, <laughs> I feel very awkward like this. <laughs> okay. Did you have a chance to take a, to write that down? Okay. And well, while you write that down, I'm going to share a little secret that I share <laughs> with my panelists here. Um, my timing is horrible. So <laughs> when I go over five, it's like, you know, um, senior project, when I go over five, over three, you just let me know, okay? We're ready? Okay, yes, okay, good. 
So a little bit about me. Um, I think that I am an ESL person. I was one day a newcomer. So uh, one thing that I thought was important for us to refresh our minds was about our identity. So when we, we look at our students, we also think about that. The fact that we have an assumed identity, an imposed identity, and finally we negotiate an identity. Many of our students, when they finally arrive here, they have not negotiated the identity of being refugees. So that is something that they are learning. We, all, we call them refugees. I was called an immigrant. I was called a foreigner. Maybe I'm still called an immigrant and a foreigner. But those are things that we negotiate. So this is a little bit about me. Um, my identity is my name, too. And though my name shows as Valeria Koba because it's too long, <laughs> um, it is my name. So my name is Maria Valeria Rivas de Koba. And these are some of the things that I'm passionate about. These are some of the things that I do. And again, this is my negotiated identity. If the seas were always calm, we would never build a better boat <laughs> that teaches I think that that explains what my philosophy is. That explains that I thrive in challenge, and that explains what the work with newcomers is like. So I think I found the perfect spot in life. I don't know if I will ever move, because challenges are daily, <laughs> and, and there I'm, I'm, I, that's, that's where I need to be. And it's also today's goals. I think that we're going to be talking about challenges today. We want to focus on challenges. We want to, we are rethinking newcomers' education. So I think that that is a perfect place where to start. Um, newcomer school. In the year 2000, when we arrived, those were uh, the ages of my daughters. Um, they were four and five years old. And there was no newcomers school in Guilford County, North Carolina. When they arrived, it was very hard for them to get adjusted. Um, as a mother, I was able to see the other side. I saw how my uh, daughters suffer through the system and how hard it was for them to become part of it. I think it's still fighting, fitting in. So, when it came to my attention that um, Dr. Henry and um, Ms. Hayes, the ESL director from Guilford County, were coming to the board to propose the opening of a newcomer school, I was one of the first advocates. And I came to the school board to tell the story of my daughters and tell the story of a newcomer to explain what it was like and how important it was for us to offer this opportunity to our students. So, in 2007, Newcomers opened its doors, and we are now celebrating our 10th anniversary. This is what it looks like today. So Newcomers School today, actually, not, not true. You know what Newcomers Life is like. They come every week, OK? <laughs> so they, they, we have now 280 students, OK? Uh, probably maybe more than 23 languages and more than 29 countries represented, being Spanish, Arabic speakers and Swahili speakers are our highest populations. 16, 17 year in Guilford County Schools, we had over 5,000 students, 5,000 L's in our district. What do we do at Newcomers? Our hope, and we were talking about that, and when we talk about live students, we, we always refer to that. But our hope is, and our vision, our purpose, our goal, is to be able to empower our students and to empower our families. We want to work and be there for both of them, not just um, our students in the building. And definitely, one of the things that happened in the history of newcomers, how it has developed, it started mainly as a language school. It started mainly, OK, we are going to adjust these kids to the American system. And then we realized that that was not enough. That was really a disservice to them if we stayed only there. And we had to move into content. We have our students for a very short period of time. So we had to move into content. We had to expose them to other things that they were going to see in their regular school because life becomes really real when they go mm -hmm. into their regular schools. So that is the purpose of newcomers, to be able to not only do the language piece, but also do the content. Today, maybe we have a set of teachers that are really focused on contents, and I have to constantly remind them, hey, we're a language school too. So I need you to be doing language. I need you to work on your language objectives. Um, newcomers is a one-year program. 
Uh, it has in it grades three through 12. So we have elementary, middle, and high, which means that I am the curriculum facilitator for elementary school and middle school and high school at the same time. We serve students from all over Guilford County, which poses an interesting um, situation with transportation. Our students are brought from all, part, all parts of the, can, the county, therefore they might take more than one bus in the morning. Therefore, in order to be at 7.35, they probably got on that bus at 5 in the morning. Mm -hmm. It is a long ride to come to newcomers and to go back home. Um, so that is one of the challenges we have, but we are very grateful that the district is willing to do, to put all that strategy so our students can get to school. Uh, we receive a st students every Tuesday, and our teachers laugh at that because every Tuesday, so there are like four or five Tuesdays in a week, I hope you know that, uh, <laughs> because they have learned that and it's every Tuesday, yes, but we like to promote it that way. So um, that's what we say. And then we transition students after one year, as I said, it's a one-year prog program, therefore after one year, that one year may fall many times during, during the school year, but we still keep students till the following transition. So we transition only students at the end of the semester. We transition at the end of January and we transition at the end of June. We have a wonderful, strong community support. We would not be able to do it without them. Um, we have UNCG supporting our students through psychological services. Um, we have um, a church who has become our PTA. We are a special school. We cannot expect our parents to put together a, P a PTA and then anyways leave in a year's time. So mm -hmm. our um, PTA is a group of um, a ministry within a church. So strong, very strong support in many ways. As I said, we have one principal, we have one assistant principal, one social worker, so jealous, one social worker, <laughs> only one, um, one uh, curriculum facilitator, one counselor, we have one media specialist, one reading specialist, um, we have interpreters in the building, we're uh, very, very grateful and, and blessed to have interpreters in the building, and then we have five elementary schools, two classes are combination third grade, fourth grade, and two classes are combination fourth grade and fifth grade, and we have one math teacher that all classes go to. Same system happens in middle school, and then in high school we have regular classes, we are in a block schedule. Now, we talked about challenges, and our students come to us with many of them. They come to a very uh, important and heavy baggage to us, and you all know them, you work with them, so they may come with trauma, with loss. Um, once you leave your country, it doesn't matter what the situation was in your country, that is really not important when it, it comes to your identity, living your country, living your culture, it is um, obviously a challenge. So several baggages, several things that they bring us, but also we face here, okay, many roadblocks. So class sizes is sometimes a problem. Last year we have an influx and probably you all uh, experienced that too of students. So for a building that can hold 300 students, we were holding 530 mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. um, now this year, we started with 260, and I will share, this is one of the challenges I was, I was sharing, that uh, day 10 is our head count, and at day 10, because we receive students every week, at day 10, we don't have the same students we will have in January, but unfortunately, at day 10, we lost two teachers. So, roadblocks, absolutely, roadblocks. Transportation, cultural differences, um, the gaps in formal education, all roadblocks. Our programs are strategic, are very deliberate, okay? And when I explain to our parents and I attempt to explain to them what our programs are like, what I like to do is to show them this picture. And I said, not your, your kids will not all receive the same thing in this building. And they might change from one class to the other, and they might come home and say, I was in, I'm in a different class, my friends are not with me. So I first day that I have my parents with me, I explain to them this is about equity. This is about each child getting what that child needs. Mm -hmm. So do not be concerned. We are definitely focused on our child needs. We're just really narrowing down to that. And of course, we want to accelerate language and content acquisition. So how do we do that? For first of all, we are shelter instruction, okay? 100% shelter instruction. 
And then, obviously, we are a WIDA school, like we are a WIDA state. So we do that mainly, and this is the, the, the ECPs, we do that mainly by keeping content, okay, standards, and differentiating the language expectation and differentiating the supports that we provide to our students. Uh, our literacy block is divided into three sections, so basically three different classes. And when, again, when I explain to the students or to the uh, parents, I say the first one is at the word level. So we do all reading foundational skills. The second one is at the sentence level. So now that I learn to read, I apply that into my reading a sentence and reading a short book, and now I can use some reading strategies. And then the third one is at the passage level. And here's where I'm going to have that shelter instruction, where I'm going to have those ELA content standards that I need to differentiate for my students. So as you see, we, when we started, as I said before, we, got, we went from just being a language acquisition to now trying to balance language acquisition with content. Mm -hmm. So in order to do that, we design a program that addresses for the, each child all this of three, of, 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 of these three levels. Now, about our live students, we do have, not in elementary, but in middle school, so in our secondary, uh, we have in middle school and in high school a specific classes for our students with limited or interrupted education. So about three years ago, um, I, I proposed to the school to start a specific, a special class for these students. They have, as we have heard, needs that are completely different. We cannot put them in the same bag with our, with our regular L's. So those needs that, were, that are so different were addressed in our school by creating a, spe a special space for them where resources are concentrated where uh, the content is differentiated even, even a little bit more, where the, the balance that we are trying to keep for the other students now really goes a lot more into the language piece that we need to acquire before we go into content. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that we have done. We have, um, for our school, we have done uh, instructional units. We have rewritten the instructional units that we receive, whether it's from the state or from the district. We, we have rewritten in such a way that we have them during the first semester, okay, and, and I will show you during the workshop samples of that and, and, and talk about that, but we have during the second semester the same unit as a framework that we have during the second semester. Why? Because we are cycling back all the time. The student that came in November didn't get what happened in August, but that's okay. They're going to get it in February, and when the one who was here in August will gets it in February, it's okay because now it's not in cultural shock and is able actually to go deeper into that content. Mm -hmm. So we recycle our units and so, so that's why we have to rewrite them because when the district gives them to you it's a year-long situation, a year-long year pacing. Mm -hmm. But then we have taken all that, taken the framework of it and rewritten our units for A and B semesters. Um, data. Well, that's one of the challenges that we have. We don't, we don't have data. How do we uh, tell the district that we are doing a good job? How do we check that our <laughs> students are actually growing? So we don't have data. We're the first data point for these students. So we have to create our own data. And that's one of the things that we have done. This is, this is what our, word, um, our data wall looks like with, with our students. Each of these cards is one of the students. The dots that you see, I, I, I will be able to explain that. Um, a little bit deeper later. Um, till last year, we were doing Fountains and Pinel as our universal assessment tools uh, for all students and newcomers. This year, we have changed to use the independent reading uh, level framework from um, the American Reading Company because Guilford County Schools has adopted um, the, um, the curriculum of um, American Reading Company, but we as newcomers have not adopted the curriculum, which has adopted the assessment tool, okay? Um, that's a little bit about newcomers. And again, what I want you to take away is that I'm, uh, we, we all face challenges. We try to adapt to those challenges. We have designed curriculum. I have designed curriculum for ELA. I have designed curriculum for uh, our word level class, which we call word work. Um, 
We level students when it's needed. We put them in grade level classes when it's needed. So we are moving them around uh, during the day. But unfortunately, they leave us after one year. So like our principal says, we have 180 days. She reminds days. Yes, there we go. 180 <laughs> days, okay? 180 days all, all the time we are reminded how many days we have to have these precious kids with us and we are supposed to give them the most that we have. So how did I do with my time? Yay! Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So can you at least put my first couple of slides? for me, just the first couple of ones. You don't have it with you? Okay, that's okay. So I'm a little, um, a little not old fashioned, but because my slides are so long and I didn't, I don't have slides, put it that way. I have them slides for this afternoon, but I'm gonna talk to you about my school. <laughs> so I'm really, um, I'm really, I have to stand up too, so sorry. So thank you for breaking the ice. Um, so uh, welcome. Um, so my name is Marie Moreno. I'm the school principal of Las Americas Newcomer School in Houston ISD. I've been there for 13 years. I'm only their second principal. And so uh, we started the school back in 01. And so, um, so a little bit about the school and a little bit about me and, and um, kind of what I'm bringing to the table today for you guys. Um, I, I walk around with my, um, with my notebook because um, I, this is my interactive notebook. And so anytime people call, you know, they see me down the hall, they're like, so what happens when a student, I tell them here, it's here, <laughs> see here, because I believe everything needs to be in writing, right? You gotta show me where it says in writing. So I walk around with that all the time. So. Um, so I have um, a school in, uh, in, in Houston, Texas that is exclusively for refugee and immigrant kids. So I was really excited to hear that there's more people like me out there because we're the Houston ISD is huge. It's a, it's a huge district. And we're the only newcomer center on, on, uh, in Houston. So there's 54,000 immigrant and refugees in HISD. And I only serve at my school, the capacity is 325. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you that HISD is not serving in a, in a way that we should, right? Um, students um, from all over the district. And so people say, how do people get to your school? And it's word of mouth, really. It's word of mouth and people just kind of know who I am. It's funny, you'll see my kids saying, Las Americas, Las Americas, and they're doing this, walking up. I'm like, how did you hear about us? my neighbor told us to come here because mm -hmm. this is where you learn English. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's a really nice kind of, um, I've, been in, I've been in the school district now for 19 years. This is my 19th year in HISD and 13 years here at the school. So a little bit about the school. We have 32 different countries represented, speaking 29 different languages. I start off the school roughly about 50 students and then I increase all the way to 325, mm -hmm. but I've gone over that because I can't say no to, pa to parents. And I was like, yeah, one more. Yeah, one more. Yeah, so we've gone as high last year. We had a big influx as well. We went up to 360 last year. And we're busting out of the seams. Mm -hmm. um, we're a very unique campus in a way that the way we, um, the way we structured our classrooms is very, very different from what HISD's um, services other campuses. I believe as a newcomer campus, we have to really help them uh, acculturate into, um, into working or, or being in a new world, right? So um, our classes are leveled by language proficiency, not by grade level. So when you walk into a classroom, um, I have grades sixth, seventh, and eighth graders all in one classroom. And um, it's a fourth through eighth campus. So I have fourth and fifth graders in one group. And then I have sixth, seventh, and eighth graders in another group. Okay. And you can distinguish who they are by the color of their lanyard. The, the, if they have a green lanyard, it's a sixth grader, a seventh grader is a black, and um, an eighth grader is uh, maroon. So that when teachers are doing more on grade stuff, then they can group them by small group that way. Um, but if they're learning a language, for example, we're talking about Scythe, right, uh, or Scythe students, I have nine levels of beginning. Mm -hmm. So stop and kind of soak that in a little bit, right? We have intermediate, we have beginning kids, intermediate, advanced, advanced high. At my school, I have nine levels of beginning. And then I have one class of intermediate. And that's mm -hmm. all I have. Mm -hmm. Right? So every student at my campus is assessed, right? So we test all of our students. As soon as they walk in, hi, I want to enroll my child at the school. So the first thing we do is test. 
right? See where they are in English. If they are, I was kind of excited to see that you're using Erla. Mm -hmm. We're, this is our third year using Erla, and so I was really excited <laughs> when I saw it. I was like, yes! Um, um, so we test our students. We've created our newcomer assessment on our campus, not necessarily the Erla. It's something in-house that we've created, mm -hmm. and it will determine, it has a rubric to tell you where um, in the nine levels are they in. Right? So do they have letter recognition? Do they know the alphabet? Mm -hmm. A, B, C, mm -hmm. D, E. When you have kids from all over the world, Arabic, Swahili, Oromo, Urdu, you know, those kinds, uh, Tecreña, it's really hard for students to, you know, they don't know their letters. And so it's kind of hard for students to read, you know, Johnny, can you please read, you know, the first, the first sentence of the, of, the, of the book, right? They can't read. They don't even know what, the sounds, what it sounds like. So we have, so we have uh, that class where we have students um, either learning how to hold a pencil, sitting down in a chair for longer than 20 minutes. Um, so, we, so we have nine levels of beginning, and it's very fluid. So my assistant principal, um, who does all the schedule changes, doesn't like just constantly changing schedules because we believe in switching, um, switching students' schedules based on those nine le levels of proficiency mm -hmm. when they're ready. Mm -hmm. It's not at the third weeks or the six weeks sure. or the nine mm -hmm. weeks. It's when it's the student is ready. You know when you have kids in your classroom and you say, okay, we're going to take a test, and they're very kind of like <laughs> shocked, right? Later on, they'll start kind of, the next couple of days, they're like, hi, miss, how are you? My name is. I was like, you speak. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. um, and so we quickly move them out of those levels and make sure that they are. Each level becomes more difficult, right, because we want those, those small milestones for them to grow and to learn to feel comfortable. Um, she was talking about um, social workers. So we have a trauma-informed curriculum on our campus mm -hmm. that we've now been um, uh, putting into place. We have, uh, this is our third year, putting, um, um, uh, really investing in trauma curriculum on our campus. Um, the Simmons Foundation, which is huge, um, just adopted us and gave us a $50,000 um, foundation mm -hmm. uh, grant to, because they really want to, you know what happens with foundations and they, they, um, they, they want to really look at what they're doing so that we can kind of promote it and then replicate it, which is good because it's something that if we, if we can kind of replicate it and let others use, use it, that's great. So, um, so during our homeroom, every teacher on campus is doing our informed curriculum for all of our students. Um, I have one social worker on campus, but I get six free. And so I have seven social workers on campus for now our... Now you understand uh, why I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> um, for a campus, so remember, I started off with about 60 students, and I grow to about 400, 360, something like that. So all of my social workers have case management, um, and they, they work with our kids individually. Um, people ask me all the time, um, how many kids have experienced trauma? I'm like, all of them. <laughs> all of them experience trauma. Different shades different shades of trauma, right, because it really depends on where, where they come from. Um, we have a lot of students from Central America, so from El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and so I tell people, those are the students that have experienced trauma like much more immediate. Like they were, they were exploited, they were, um, they were held by the setas, or they were, you know, uh, held at gunpoint, much more recent than maybe refugee f families that were on a refugee camp where it's a little, little safer, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so they've been mm -hmm. living on a refugee camp for years or maybe born on a refugee camp, mm -hmm. right? But they are more and a much more, not that it's safe there, but it's a little, um, a little safer <laughs> um, than necessarily coming through Mexico and trying to uh, cross the border. Um, I tell my teachers all the time to read um, Enrique's Journey. Um, which is a really good book because a lot of my fam a lot of my teachers, again, if you don't teach your teachers, um, they'll ask um, not inappropriate questions like, so how was that plane ride from El Salvador? <laughs> what? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, um, or they'll think it was a one-shot deal, you know, where they walked through Mexico and they were done. I was like, no, these kids are very resilient. They, they, were, um, they were deported. They came back. They were deported again. They tried it again, and so if you read the book, Enrique's Journey, it's a really, really good way of, of, of understanding how that works. The other one, if you're not a reader, there's another book, uh, another movie called uh, A Good Lie with Reese Witherspoon. Oh, right. yes. um, it's a really, if you, if you, that's something that I try and help uh, educate my, um, 
my teachers as well. It's a, it's a Congolese family that has um, made the journey and is here now settled in the United States. And so things like answering the phone, the phone is ringing and they have no idea what the phone, why it's ringing or electricity or anything like that. So it really kind of helps um, my teachers understand that. Um, all of our kids have, um, we have a free, um, a free clothing closet at our campus. So all of our families can come in and uh, shop for clothes. So I clothe the entire family, not necessarily our kids. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's important, if you think about it, um, not, not being in a foreign country, they don't have a job, they don't have, and they're trying to kind of make ends meet. Purchasing uniforms is just, I mean, I have a child and it's expensive for me, right? And so we, we have that, um, that available for not only our kids, but our entire family. If they're looking for a job, they can find a tie and a jacket and, and some shoes. All of our kids also have free health care. So we work with um, Herman, Memorial Herman Hospital. So we have a uh, site clinic on, on site. Um, and it's part of the registration process. So when students um, are ill, instead of going to the nurse and then they, the nurse certifies you, yep, you do have a fever, call your mama. You know, mama's not gonna do anything, right? And so we automatically um, call mom and tell mom, mom, they have a fever, call the doctor, and then um, they go to the doctor and get their medication. Medication is also free to them. Dental is free and vision is free. And so we, we wanna try, and if you think of Maslow hierarchy of needs, Right? I tell people you have to take care of their needs first before they can even start yeah. providing them with education. Because if they're not, um, if, if you don't take care of their needs, if, you know, think about it, you're constantly thinking about what am I gonna do next? Am I gonna go home, am I gonna eat? Am I gonna have, you know, those, those needs need to be met. Um, we provide children, we provide our parents with free ESL classes as well. Because you know our kids, they start becoming much more English proficient and then they depend, parents depend on their children. ¿Qué dicen, mijito? ¿Qué dice? You know, what are they saying, right? And so I tell parents, no, 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 no. You learn English just like your children learn English, right? And you guys do your homework together, right? And so, um, so we also have that as well on our campus. Um, it's a very, very unique place um, for, for, uh, for our kids to learn and grow. Um, and so we have, um, so my presentation later on, I'll talk a little bit about, um, a little bit about the trauma curriculum that we have. We can also talk about um, um, accountability. Sometimes that's, um, as, a, as a principal, I'm always constantly trying to convince the higher people above me what I'm doing is what's best for kids. And I always tell them, when you look at my results and you look at my test scores and you're not satisfied with them, then have a conversation with me. Right? Until then, let me continue to teach the consonants and the vowels and the blends and the digraphs and all of those um, scaffold stuff that you need before you can start doing content. Um, and then, if you don't like that, then, so uh, you guys are a WIDA school, so we're a telepath because Texas is its own like, country, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, like the whole world is WIDA, and then there's Texas, right? Um, so we're a telepath, we're not a WIDA school. So if you look at um, our, our telepath scores um, in HISD, um, one year of growth for, our camp for HISD is 45%, which is really low. So at my school, we have 90% showing one year's growth. And so when I tell my, my staff or my, um, the higher people above me, when you don't like those results, then yeah, we'll have a conversation. Right now, what we're doing is best for kids. And so um, I'm really excited to, to be here with you and um, hope to, to really learn from all of you because mm -hmm. I'm only mm -hmm. as good as what I learned from you. And so I'm hoping that, um, I told my boss, because you know we had the big hurricane, right? Um, we had Harvey, and so this is our first week of school. So my boss says, you're already going to a conference? It's the first week of school. And I was like, well, um, I said, this is, my, this is my professional development. And so I know I'm here to kind of share uh, our schools, and, and, but I'm like totally gonna go do a site visit for her already. And, and, so, uh, and, and you guys are just incredible. So thank you so much for inviting me and uh, hope to see you guys this afternoon. Y'all in the back can't hear, please just yell up at me and I'll talk louder. Does it sound good? Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. 
Um, so I, I was glad that you mentioned um, parent involvement and the infrastructure that you have, and I wonder mm -hmm. if the both of you could talk a little bit um, maybe about your interactions with the parents of your students um, and what involvement um, they have or ways that you've engaged them in the, the curriculum process. Okay. Me? You? You want to start? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so for uh, parent involvement, that's a very tricky one because when you have at our campus, we have 29 different languages. And so um, we always have a, a Spanish group and then we have an English group where it's very ESL-y, if you will, where you're talking and sighing and, and jumping up and down. Um, but one of the things that I, uh, what we do on our campus is it's the how-tos, how right? How to read a report card how to uh, read a progress report. What's the difference between a progress report and a, and a report card? What is credits? Mm -hmm. How do you gain credits? Can credits be taken away from you? Can you have to, do you have to appeal credits? How does attendance work? It's the how-tos of, of being in a school system. We always talk about you know, um, parent involvement. Par they don't know how to be involved. Mm -hmm. That you have to kind of guide them as to how do you, so, we, so when you walk into our, um, our registration area, we have a big old bulletin board and it says um, it's important for you to be in school, right? And I tell that, I, I kind of make it sound easy for parents to understand, but then I provide bullets. You know, it's like um, um, participate in a classroom where they can um, um, uh, volunteer in a classroom or help with our clothing closet or we'll teach them how they're illiterate themselves, and so we want them to help them with homework. Okay, stop and think about that, right? It's like, how, how, how do you do that, right? So we tell them, uh, how, do you, how do you manage that? When you look at a blank sheet of paper and that's their homework, well, there's nothing written on there. You have to sound, you know, you need to sit down and, and do your work. You may not know what it's on there, but at least you know that they attempted to, to, to do something as opposed to not even trying, right? Um, so we try and do um, uh, really help parents understand the ins and outs of school because they don't know that and I want them since we're also on our campus just for a year as well it's really important for them to to manage how do you how do you do this later on in life and so it's funny because parents will come back to me and say well I didn't get the schooling that she did mm -hmm. so can you can I come and talk to you during your schooling time but that's a year-long process I have I call it that's my classroom. Those are so parent meetings. I have them once a month, and that's that's me. That's my teaching, and that's my classroom. And those are my teachers uh, or my kids. I call them my kids, even though they're my parents. Um, and so that's kind of how I kind of work with parent involvement at our campus. Our superintendent says we're not going to call it parent involvement anymore because he says this is, and I love him because he's he's new to us but he says if you want your parents involved hit the child mm -hmm. the child will that parent will get involved really fast mm -hmm. he says you wanna you wanna do parent empowerment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right because you wanna empower your families show them the rules show them how do you advocate for your children um, we even show them when you get those test results how do you read that test result because the parents will say que dice no, no sé, right? And they're like, I don't know what this is. It's like, no, you got to stop saying, I don't know how, mm -hmm. and then understand how to read it so that you can sit down with the counselor and say, I'm concerned. Last year it says 400, and this time it says 300. It's going down. It's not going up, right? So what are we doing? So having it, teaching them how to have those structured conversations to help advocate for their children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, at newcomers, we, we face the same challenges, um, and also a, another challenge that probably you know you also see is transportation. Many of our parents, well, even their job. So um, sometimes they work third shift, and so uh, it's really hard to have them in the morning uh, or during the day at school. Uh, transportation, many of them do not have transportation. So for many of the parent activities, parent events that we do, we provide transportation and just pretty much in the same way we go around picking up students, buses, uh, school buses are going to go around picking up families to bring them into the school. Um, we have, other than open house, we have um, two parent days that are on Saturdays and the way we organize them is 
in, uh, just like uh, Marie was saying, in small workshops where we teach them the how-tos of the school. We also teach them uh, how-tos of the community because we want them to be also knowledgeable of the opportunities and resources that they have in their communities. Um, we, rather than having a situation like we have today of a big group, basically what we do, we have a smaller groups and each group has, it's, each one is a language group. So we go, um, the presenters are the ones who rotate through the different rooms, and in e each room has an interpreter, and we rotate presenting the information to the parents. Um, other than that, we also have um, a day where, again, we go around picking up um, parents, and we bring them into the school for them to see, because most of the time when they are there, the school is, in our case, a school is not in session. So we bring them during the school day so they can see their children in the classroom. And also, um, after we, we do lunch and everything with them, they, they, they see the whole routine. But after that, we invite the students to come into the cafeteria, sit with their parents, and have a student-led conference uh, that they have in their native language. So the parent is able to see and, and everything that they have been doing and you know how their baseline, uh, what the baseline look like and how they are writing now and, and they share very proudly those things with them. We also have um, what we call family literacy celebrations. We have one in the fall for elementary students, one in uh, the spring for middle school students and it's based on a book. One of the things that we do for our students is, okay, we do language, we do content, but also we need to teach them to advocate for themselves. We need to teach them to be leaders. So we have a group of what we call <laughs> student leaders. And the student leaders are really empowered within the school. Um, we want them to be able to go out and, and, and advocate for themselves. So they, they do, events, they organize events, and one of the events that they are in charge of is the family literacy. So they read this storybook, they create small workshops, and then we have the families going through these stations, going through these rooms, which are s different settings of the story, and they are told the story, they do activities with their children, and we end the day having lunch all together. And that is led by our own, very own high school students that are mm -hmm. in the building. So again, we have two um, family literacy days. So, so, so those are some of the events that we do that are kind of fixed in our calendar. Thank you, thanks. Um, and then, um, Andrea, you talked a lot about um, sort of connecting things to the students' experience and to their, um, their culture mm -hmm. and what they need and relevant to their world. And I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate on what that looks like in a classroom setting where you have students who all come from a variety of different backgrounds and what's going to be um, very relevant to one group might not be relevant to the other. And everyone's so strange is mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a very good question. That comes up a lot. What does it mean to be immediately relevant? Well, one of the things that um, I talk a lot about in my work is that before you start a lesson or a unit, you can do something like a survey. You know, and, you know they, they're a very simple survey. For example, um, how many of you have a cell phone, a smartphone? I understand, you know, they, could, they raise their hands or whatever. Or you can ask, how many of you like to watch movies? You know, a simple question. So they can come up with some questions. And then you can take these questions and you can talk about, you, know, you can tally them. And as soon as you t tally them, you already have a table. So you mm -hmm. all, and this is immediately relevant because this is their information that they're sharing with them. You're already introducing the whole idea of here's a table, and I'm just gonna go through this quickly because we don't have that much time. But then you can, from that table that you've got of maybe four questions, and they can, you can make a bar graph. And now you've already, or you're already introducing an academic way of thinking namely a bar graph, which is very, and it's math, but it is immediately relevant. It's all their information. The language is familiar, the content is familiar, and then, then you go work with the math teacher and whatever it is that you want to do, or maybe they have to do <coughs> social studies, learn how to read a, um, a bar graph. But they already, you've introduced it by doing something immediately relevant. And it doesn't, it's not, not you know, individually, culturally um, dependent, but, um, and that's just a simple example because, of course, you can get much more involved in what does it mean to be immediately relevant. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but there, there are commonalities regardless of what their culture is or what their backgrounds are. And then as you learn your students, as you know them more, then you can find more specific areas that are immediately relevant to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And I'll, I'll kind of, an, another way of even looking at that is, you know, we, we're so, ESL teachers are so accustomed to what's the academic word, draw a picture, and write it in your own language, yes. right? That's very, very common. We mm -hmm. do that. I, mm -hmm. I stretch my teachers a little, more, a little bit more, and I say, let's do one more thing. So we'll have another, uh, another column. So for example, when we do the lesson on the parts of a cell, mm -hmm. right? So they're doing, they're doing the parts of a cell. So the last column is what do they know about from previous knowledge that they can relate to. So, um, so for parts of a cell, you have, for example, um, vacuoles, right, which is storage. So in a school setting, where is the storage room, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, when, you have, um, when you have the nucleus, What's the nucleus, right, and they draw a picture and they write it in their language, what's the nucleus of a school, right? And so the nucleus of a school is the principal's office, right? So they walk around with their little clipboard and the teacher kind of did all of that mm -hmm. stuff, you know, in the classroom and so they'll do a, a, so they look at the school as a cell and they have vacuoles, mitochondria, nucleus, cell wall, cell membrane, we do all of that based on just the cell. And so kids can understand, oh, that's the food, that's, you know, and so they're able to kind of connect, and that's kind of that immediate, that immediate kind of connection to something that they can already know with a big old word that is very foreign to them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, and I completely relate to what you were saying, um, especially with, as I mentioned, that we adopt the adapted curriculum um, for our um, students with interrupted formal education and it's it's common that you know you need to, to do this mind shift because you think oh poor thing they don't know anything okay so that that is a, a very bad starting point so I, I tell I tell the teachers they do they probably know more than you in different areas um, they probably have experienced more than you in different areas. So they do. They do know a lot. Now you need to go back to that point of their knowledge, and that's your starting point for the new teaching. So when we talk about science, many of these kids can cook, and many of these kids can cook in conditions that we would not even imagine. So um, asking them, you know, bringing, bringing things to them, and, and then from there you're going to start talking about, you know, chemical changes, and you're going to start talking about tons of things within your science class. But if you, st you start the opposite way, you start the academic way, you lost them. Mm -hmm. But then mm -hmm. when you put name, academic language, academic labels and names to what they already know, that's a completely different story. And hooking back onto onto the the food, they usually don't know. They don't measure with a cup or with a spoon mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. whatever. So then you're already going back to that foundational knowledge in terms of well, this is <coughs> this is a cup, this is an ounce, and then and building on that, mm -hmm. moving on then to the more advanced the chemical. But that's familiar language and content. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. And then going back a little bit to parent involvement, both of you mentioned um, social workers um, and about connecting through networks outside of your schools and I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit on that and ways to mm -hmm. um, connect with students to the, the broader community that they're now living in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I, the community involvement for our school is essential. I, I don't think that we would be able to survive um, the way we do without them. Um, there are so many resources that we lack. Uh, as uh, Marie mentioned, we also have a clothing closet. Um, the, the peace of mind that our students, our families have to know that they can come and no one is going to charge them anything and they can just go in and take what they need. Um, that community involved, that, that we, we would not be able to do, N not to do or to maintain. Um, so for those things to be sustainable, for them, um, as I mentioned before, the, the connection and the partnership with different universities, we're very blessed that in Guilford County we have seven universities. So the connection, I, I got to a point now in our 10th year that it seems to be like kind of a competition, okay? <laughs> and and we, we are fine with that, <laughs> absolutely. So um, they, they all want to know more about our students. They all want to know more about refugees and they're offering all these services. So for accountability, um, we have the um, 
uh, Appalachian State interested in doing research for us so we could work a system where we can show the state in a different way that the, the F that we have in our report card, if you look at newcomers, you'll see that it has an F in the report card, which according to, and we can keep it you know, within these walls, according to um, my principle means food and fabulous. That's what <laughs> <laughs> Because it's so distressing. She speaks my language. <laughs> <laughs> it's so distressing, even for you know, for our teachers. They leave their heart and soul, and then you 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 are addressed as an F school. Um, so th those things, um, our campus, the beautification of our campus, that is in the hands of the community. Um, there, there's so many things that they take part of. Um, definitely, I don't think that we will be able to function the way we do without them. So let me kind of let me kind of flip it in a different angle, right? So yes, it's important to have um, community support, but uh, let me talk a little bit about how, right? Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. do you create that community mm -hmm. support? Because mm -hmm. um, for many of Good you, point. you may not have that support, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So this is kind of when when. When I took over the school, it was um, it was nowhere where it was now, right? I mean, it was almost, are we going to keep it open? Are we going to close it? It's, it's always that kind of, and so I had to find my army, right? And it's my army of, you know, when your boss tells you, you need to control your community, right? <laughs> and it's like, I don't know what to tell them. I'm like, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have those advocates out there. So, um, so let me talk a little bit about, you know, how how do you create those uh, partnerships in communities? If you're waiting for them to come knocking on your door, mm -hmm. you're gonna mm -hmm. wait until the cows come home, right? Um, so one of the things that I've started is, you know, I go out to churches, I go out to um, different. Um, the Houston Chamber of Commerce and the Houston um, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and um, Houston Leadership Academy and diff different networks out there. Um, I spoke to a group of nuns one time, you know, because you just never know who's in that audience that's going to, um, who they know and, and they just kind of, it just spreads. Network. And, and that network, they, then they start calling me, hi, I heard you speak at you know, such and such place. And so that clothing closet, that's kind of ran on its own now. It was something that I was going in there on Saturdays and trying to put that back together again, or you know, donations, you know, how, do you, how do you replenish all of that? And so now we just get tons and tons of stuff now because Houston Community College now donates and we have all these churches and wintertime is coming. So I, I highly encourage um, I highly encourage you. That's how we started off with the with the dental, you know, we, uh, with the dental clinic now, where all they have to say now is I'm a student at Las Americas. They're like, oh yeah, come on in, you know. Um, we have a couple of attorneys now that they will waive the consultation fee if they just say they're from Las Americas, mm -hmm. you know. And it's all because of you know going out there and and. Um, our previous superintendent um, had us go through Rice University's marketing program, their uh, strategic marketing. Uh, it's a, it's a, univer uh, it's a uh, master's mm -hmm. level class. And so what I learned from that was you have to be good at something, right? McDonald's is good at their french fries, right? And so they market that french fry like you wouldn't, maybe their burgers aren't that great, but that, that, those french fries are awesome, right? <laughs> so that's kind of what, what he wanted us to, and I took that, and I said, we have to be the best newcomer program in America, right? And so how do, so I take that marketing and I share that with everybody that I can, that will listen to me. And I tell them all the great things that we're doing. And there's one thing, I could be a mentor. I could read to, you know, I have money. I have, um, so all of that has now transitioned to, um, for example, traditions. Halloween. Most of our parents don't even want to send their children to school because it's, you know, the other los brujas and it's, you know, scary and it's that kind of stuff. So we've changed that. We step, we baby step that now. So now we we to introduce Halloween to kids, we have a whole week of literacy. We read the adults, every adult including myself has to find a book and we read during that week to the kids. And then Halloween, that character in that book comes alive. So we call it books come alive. Right, so every adult in the building gets dressed up into that character, or that book that they read. Um, Thanksgiving traditions, 
We talk about, you know, what is Thanksgiving? It's their first Thanksgiving in America. They've never celebrated Thanksgiving in their country, right? And so we, we do those kinds of things, but that was all from other people bringing those ideas in. And when you bring an idea, you gotta bring the resources, right? And so mm -hmm. now the church across the street does a huge Thanksgiving dinner for all of my families. And they have mm -hmm. turkey and they have, you know, apple pie and those kinds of things. So it's, it's all of that, just this networking and really talking to the community about the great things that you're doing in your campus and you're gonna have people like knocking down your door and that's what you want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just to kind of a little, another approach is in a lot of um, cultures, the elders are the key point people. And if you can make contact with the elders, um, and not, not the community resources, but the, the families or the culture, the community networks within those families, they are incredible resources and they can be the ones often coming into the school. They will work with the children, even if they're not English proficient, there are other things that they contribute in terms of their own culture and in terms of keeping the connections alive to seeing this is the, this is the United States, but we're, we're still honoring your cultural traditions and we're involving you. And sometimes, or many times, when there are um, um, discipline problems, if you want to use them, dis I mean, I don't really like to use that word, but it's kind of a term we all understand. The elders are the ones when you work with them who will look at them and take it from a cultural approach and say, this is how we work with it. Um, and people will ask, well, how do you get to know the elders? And that's, again, it's not always easy to find that key person, but a lot of times in the, if you're working with uh, refugee resettlement programs, mm -hmm. for example, they know who that person is. And they also will help you with the interpreter to get to that person mm -hmm. and work with that person. And they're very, um, many of the refugees, and you brought this up, is that they have this identity crisis. They're no longer the elder with the same respect and role that they had in their home culture. They come here and you're giving that back to them, part of their identity. So that's another very important resource. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can we please do all these over and we'll have questions we have at the back. Yes, go ahead. Um, so for Valerie and Maria, I think we're at, uh, many of us in the room are ESL teachers here in Durham, um, and we would love to have a newcomer school established. <laughs> um, and, and I think because our, our situation with resources in our state is so dire and has been for years and is getting worse, um, I'd just love to know what had to happen politically for your schools <laughs> to open. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, going back to 2007, um, there was a lot of research done that was presented to um, the Board of Education, um, obviously um, even in the, in the budgeting piece, but also um, the, we, 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 took, we actually took the model from a, a newcomer school that is in New York. And um, we got their, the, the information, the research um, as to how our population will benefit from having such a school. And it was not easy. It, it definitely was many times going to the board. It was community, as we said, community. ESL teachers like me at that moment, ESL teachers going to the board and saying, this is what we need. This is what is good for our students. Um, so it, it, it took about a, a year off going to the board and going to the board. And, and, and you know, we all know how, how this system works. When you as an ESL teacher ask for it, it's not gonna happen, okay? Sometimes even when an ESL director goes, it's not gonna happen. But when the community gets involved and the community is knocking on the door and the community is saying, this is what we need, um, even when I talk about community, I'm talking about even parents of students that are today in the system, and I can argue in front of the board that my child would have benefit and today would probably be performing at grade level if, you know, that he, would, he or she would have had that support. So that is when the wheels start turning. Yeah, I, I would agree with everything you said. I mean, I, I'm their second principal, so it was already established. You established yours. Yeah. Um, but I can tell you in the 13 years that I've been there, I mean, early on when I was my first, second, third year as being the principal, I was constantly fighting why we need to stay open, why and it was that whole why, you know. And, mm -hmm. and it, wasn't, um, it wasn't necessarily me. My voice as a school principal means mm -hmm. nothing to the board. 
It means everything is the community. It's what parents want. Par they want to make sure the parents and the community are happy. And so it's whatever. And so if you can get your community on board, um, I would also t argue and, and say, you know, even if you invite um, um, Austin, I, not Austin, what's, what school district? I, I get about maybe 14 school districts come visit me all the time. But there was a school district in Texas um, that was opening up a, a uh, they were thinking about opening up a newcomer center. And so they brought about 30 people to come visit. Community members, they had uh, council members, they had parents, and so they all came and I hosted them for a day, right? And so they wanted to see what does this look like? What is, um, how does the accountability look like? What are the resources? You know, what, what is it, um, what, what are the ins and outs and the do's and don'ts, if you will? Because it's almost com it's almost convincing a community that this is what's best for kids, and mm -hmm. you know it's like seeing is believing. You almost have to see it to believe it. And so having them there, they were, I mean, you were they were just in shock. They were like, "Wow, these kids don't know how to hold a pencil." And I said, mm -hmm. "When you put them all in a classroom, they get masks. You mm -hmm. don't really see these kids, mm -hmm. right? And so it's hard. Are you, you know, and they they preach. You know, we we make sure we take care of every student. Well, are you? You know, are you really doing that when, when you can't really see them, right? So it's important to, you know, establish a welcome center, establish a way of knowing where, where their strengths are, what they don't know, those kinds of things, and then really giving them the support that they need um, because throwing them into, um, throwing them into a, 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 a mainstream environment is not going to give them um, the support they need. It's almost like putting my child in a regular classroom who doesn't know how to read we, we all believe in early childhood education. We all want our children to have the basics and the foundations. Our kids need the basics and foundations too. So what's so different about a newcomer um, and, and just throwing them in there, they're not gonna get the basic and the foundation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just have, I know a district is moving into a model that it's gonna be computer-based and I haven't, I do not understand a lot about it yet, but it's moving into a model for um, the, some of the newcomers. And I just wanted to know if there's any model that you guys know or understand where a, a computer-based model it has been effective, can, can you can you elaborate on that? I so it's a model. Really is this the? About it. I guess I'm, the just, I'm really curious about what I've been asking. What, what, what they're doing, what they're doing is it. the performance learning center <coughs> that's typically taking kids who are not functioning well in the classroom and putting them in online education. Mm. So they're talking about a wing of newcomers with interrupted formal education having this little and it's. But, it goes but, but to be fair, like she says, that they're getting away from the computer base. It's yes. going to be more direct mm -hmm. instruction. Okay. And, well, and the yeah. other thing they're doing is they want to do um, partnering some of the students with internships, which mm -hmm. is great, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. getting them into the community mm -hmm. relevant mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are overage kids. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we were getting kids in that were 19 mm -hmm. years old, young mm -hmm. men. Mm -hmm. and enrolled as ninth graders in class mm -hmm. 14 year olds. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, so I understand where they're headed with it, but it doesn't look like a full newcomer academy. Mm -hmm. It's like we're, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. this is just. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> well, well uh, what I can say about that, um, um, at newcomers or, or, I, or in within Guilford, I have not heard of anything like that. Um, what Every 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 ounce and every cell in me knows that the 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 most important resource that we have in schools is the human resource. Mm -hmm. um, so that probably answers the question of what. <laughs> <laughs> the um, I have to say that um, the putting students let's, let's putting slides in front of a computer has not been successful, mm -hmm. and teachers. Mm -hmm. Uh, in low incidence districts who have been told this is their resource, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it has not worked mm -hmm. any better than giving a student a slice, a worksheet, and say, here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because if they don't know how to hold a utensil, how do they know how to use a 
Th they'll get the mouse and they'll put it on the wall, on the, on the screen. And it's like, no, baby, no, no, over here. And even if they're farther along the ways of learning continuum where they, you know, they have the basics, they, you know, you're still, ex you're even, I teach online at the graduate level, and I have students there who don't do well, and I have to have face-to-face -face online mm -hmm. conversations with them, and we're asking twice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, who don't have this identity as a learner, never mind to, you know, going in front of a computer screen. Yeah, so I would say beware, mm -hmm. because um, lots of companies will come to you. I mean, they come to me. They come to me all the time. They're like, oh, we have this awesome, you know, computer program, and, and so sometimes just because I want to be mean, um, I'll say, yeah, come into my office. I'll give you 10 minutes. And so they'll sit down in my office and they'll set it up and then they'll, they'll go through the whole thing. And I was like, so where is the phonics? Where is that portion of it? Because this is not in here. And they're like, oh, well, this is for newcomer students. And I was like, come with me. Mm -hmm. So then I'll, t I'll walk them over to my brand new beginning, brand new beginning kids. And they're like, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this isn't going to work for them. I said, how about this class over here and this class and this class? So remember, I have nine levels of beginning. I go through each one of them. And then at the very end, they're like, this one, this one would be good. And I was like, those are intermediate kids. Yeah, yeah it's good for that group because they can already understand. So mm -hmm. they said, well, would you want to buy it for that class? No. no. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask the two of you um, whether you are satisfied with it being a one-year program, or if you had the resources, like how long do you think would be ideal? Ooh, where they would go ideal. Hmm. That, that's. I, I'm. I'm gonna skip that question. I, the ideal. I don't know. I don't know because it is a case-by-case -case scenario. Um, so I really don't know what would be ideal. Um, but I can tell you that we we have kids that we have a one-year program, and we have kids that after the six months. They transition, um, so you know that would be the opposite side. And I have kids that after you know one year of being in the program, you just you are begging for them to stay. Um, so it, it is hard. Ideal, I think it would be that we have the freedom to decide based on evidence and based on the teach the student performance and the student educational background and educational needs how long that student will stay. So I live with both worlds, okay? So when I started the school, or when I was uh, the principal at this particular school, um, I had two campuses. I had Las Americas, newcomer, and I had Kaleidoscope Middle School. You don't know this part. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had Kaleidoscope Middle School, and so they were both housed in the same location, yeah. right? And so the principal had one faculty meeting for this school and one faculty meeting for this school. And I was like, that's insane. I'm not going to do two faculty. So I just married both of them, right? The, the Kaleidoscope Middle School that I had was an on grade level, at risk. My, my comp competition was like private schools. We were a red ribbon school. We were like top notch. And then I had newcomers. Mm -hmm. So what I did was um, at the time, because they were both housed together, I was able to keep my kids for longer than a year. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was mm -hmm. able to keep them longer than a year because they were mixed with non-ELL students, right? right? So I had my Las Americas and those kids that were rising up, they were like they were like bubbling up. I would move them over and they would like unnecessarily audit the class. They were still enrolled at Las Americas, mm -hmm. but I would stick them in kaleidoscope pre-AP classes, mm -hmm. right? So what happens to a, uh, ELL students in a pre-AP class? They look around the room, they're like, oh my God, I better do my homework. <laughs> because everybody else is like really, really smart and I need to be just as smart as them, you know? So those kids were rocking it. They were, so when my scores were coming back from the state, the school board says, these are second year immigrant kids and they're scoring at the 90th percentile. This is amazing. We need to make Las Americas bigger. So they closed my top-notch school, okay, to open up Las Americas and add fourth and fifth grade, right, because I was only in middle school. Add fourth and fifth grade, and I kept on telling them, you guys can't do that. It's a married program, right? And so they closed it anyways because they don't listen to me. And, um, and so now I can only keep them for a year. But my data back then, right, back then, kids that were scoring at the kinder first, second grade reading was reading at ninth and 10th grade uh, by the time they went to high school. 
Hmm. So I have the data to show if you put those kids, but remember it's, it's so then they say, well, we can send them to a pre-AP at another campus. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't work that way because I'm the one with the lens. Mm -hmm. I would walk in, I was like, pre-AP class, he's, how are you going to include that kid, right? He's, he's a Las America student in this pre-AP mm -hmm. class. So I was able to kind of do both. So one day I'm hoping that I can convince my board to continue to do that because the data is there to show that my kids can outperform non-ELL students if I can just keep them longer than a year. Mm -hmm. I just want to clarify that the reason uh, why we keep them is not that we, we, we choose. So I'll make sure that everyone knows that it is a mandate from the Office of Civil mm -hmm. Rights. Mm -hmm. Our students, our school is considered a segregated school. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they have, we have the opportunity, they have given us the opportunity to have them for one, one year. year. Mm -hmm. But truly, you know, that is not, n not even possible. So they have, just change things and rules for these students to be able to be with us for one year, but because we are segregated, that cannot be longer than one year. So um, I'm a little bit curious because we have a Ducumi school and within an elementary school in Chapel Hill that we studied and came and visited the Guilford School before we opened. But my, I'm curious because in my former life, I was in a lawyer and. I'm wondering how we can get around this one year thing by pushing our kids maybe, how much time do they have to spend mm -hmm. in a regular classroom mm -hmm. to get around that one year, I'm wondering. Yeah, um, I don't know. I think that just like you mentioned, um, the, only, the only ideas we, we have always played with is partnering with whether it is another uh, you know, a charter school or partnering with an international school or becoming just, just not being just newcomers anymore. If um, you mix them, it, right. Yeah. That's why when I had Kaleidoscope with me, I could keep my kids for three years. They can start as a sixth grader and end with me as an eighth grader and then go to high school. Mm -hmm. So long as they're mixing with non-ELL students, the government doesn't care. Mm -hmm. But when How it's only... I'm sorry. How much? I, I don't know. I, I don't know percentages. Do you? Um, as, as long as it's as long as it's mis mixing. So for as us, at least in Texas, right? So for our campus, um, they were Las Americas newcomer, and it was Kaleidoscope. Uh, elective classes, they were mixing, and so that was good enough for our state. To as long as they were mixing in non, and I just I just said non academic classes. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, PE, art, whatever electives I was offering, as long as there was a mixture of kids in there, I could keep I could keep my kids as long mm -hmm. as I wanted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's a state by state thing, though, because I've been in schools in, in other states where they're there longer, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there are schools that are not newcomer sliced necessarily, but they're L's. They're you know there's ninety percent L's, and they have them throughout. So. Mm -hmm. Um, there's court cases, that district court cases in, in Pennsylvania you might want to look at. Um, there, there are newcomer schools in Minnesota, Massachusetts, New York State, Minnesota, Virginia. Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> Director <laughs> notebook. But I can't, I'm not a lawyer or a legal person, but you might want to look at the, the regulations. How there's so here is the regulations in my notebook. <laughs> <laughs> the interactive notebook. <laughs> we will all have so an interactive notebook so, after today. So this is the, uh, the Office of Civil Justice in the U.S. Department of Education. So when it first came out, this is, it's a four-page document uh, where it talks about how you can't keep your kids mm -hmm. for longer than a year. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, it's, I'm telling you, I'm a walking dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I'm I'm not proud to say that there is a there is a gap between newcomers and so the newcomers world and outside newcomers world. I I worked as an ESL teacher outside newcomers for 13 years before coming in uh, on board, 
and um, there's definitely a gap. We work really hard uh, trying to do that transition. Uh, unfortunately, the ones who suffer through that gap are our own students. Uh, we work really hard we, we, for our elementary and our middle school kids. We ask the, the schools that they're going to transition to to send uh, representatives. And so they come and have breakfast with our kids a couple of times during the year. They, they, they bring things from their school, linears or things, things pencils that have the name, they, they, you know, a T-shirt, something to encourage the kids and, and, and f make them feel more comfortable. And also faces to know, so they, they, they transition, they know some people. Our our campus is small. If you've ever, ever been there, our campus is really small. So those those kids walk around like, I'm going to see the counselor, I'm going to see the social worker, I need, I need this, I need that. Uh, something that when they move from a, a building of 200, 300 people to, you know, 2,000, then they stop doing. So we need to work on that. With our high school kids, we get them on buses and we do field trips to their new school. So we, we take them there, uh, we spend the day, we have lunch, we you know tour the school, we meet the counselors, we make sure that they are enrolled, um, they choose their elective classes. So all those things happening. So th those are efforts for, for that to happen. We, we also have um, quite a bit of professional development during the year where ESL teachers from the district and ESL teachers and newcomers work together. And that also helps because we, we, we hear the experiences from one and the other. But I believe that there's a lot more we need to do. Uh, having been outside and now being inside, from outside was like, what are they doing on newcomers? You know, <laughs> what are they doing? They had them for a year. What are they doing? <laughs> um, so now I know what they are doing, and it's a lot. Uh, but that, that brokenness in that communication um, is, is, is not helpful. Stretch and we can switch out. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> can you eat? <laughs> 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 <laughs>